In 1897, Victoria's Diamond Jubilee celebrations were the expression of supreme confidence. She was Queen of Great Britain. She was Empress of India. Her empire, in fact, stretched all over the world. What made the event so remarkable wasn't just the fact that the streets of London were thronged with thousands of people singing God Save the Queen, as that the 78-year-old monarch was prepared to be seen in public at all. The widow of Windsor, as she was known, struggled with public appearances because she was shy, but also because she was still ostensibly in mourning. For 36 years, she'd been the embodiment of grief. But appearances are deceptive. Behind this well-known image of Victoria lies another story to that of the heartbroken widow. It was only part of the truth about Victoria, whose marriage had been a source of constraint, as well as deep love. The loss of her beloved husband and of her mother was a terrible blow, but it also initiated a process of liberation for a woman who'd spent her entire life under the shadow of domineering men. Victoria had been a pawn in a political game as a child and young queen. Her angel, Prince Albert, had used her pregnancies as a way to gain power and punished her for resenting it. But in her widowhood, Victoria, although bereft and deranged, was free to embark on a way of life and on loves that were to make her last four decades her most productive and exciting. And luckily for us, she committed all her feelings to paper. She wrote more than 50 million words. Some were judged so shocking by her children that when she died, they were destroyed. I've spent the last five years reading Queen Victoria's journals and unpublished letters. And I've come to feel something almost approaching awe for her. Behind that stout old lady in black sitting at her writing table was a passionate human being. And contrary to what is so often said, she was frequently and easily amused. Eighteen sixty one was Queen Victoria's Annus Horribilis. The deaths of her mother and her husband left her distraught. She fled London. It was presumed that her absence from the capital meant she was doing nothing, left inept by grief. In her journal, she bewailed the loss of her lover, her friend, her crutch. He did everything, everywhere. Nothing did I do without him, from the greatest to the smallest. My first word was, I must ask Albert. In her delirium, she turned the man she'd often resented and fought with into a demigod. What Victoria didn't realize at 42 years old was that marriage had infantilized her. Marriage does infantilize people. She'd come to rely on Albert for absolutely everything. She'd not see him first thing in the morning and say, what dress should I put on? In politics and in personal life, he had restrained her and controlled her. And now his life was over, but her life wasn't over. Little by little, she would flap her wings and become free. And her first small steps to freedom were taken here in Coburg, in modern day Germany, her homeland and the birthplace of Albert and her mother. She confessed her ongoing love affair with Germany in her journal. If I were not who I am, my real home would be here. Victoria was three quarters German. She idolized the land and the people. The very air smelled like Albert, and she breathed it in. When she started coming back to Coburg, her brother-in-law, Ernst, Albert's brother, expected her to stay with him in his grand Baroque palace in the middle of town, Schloss Ehrenberg. But she preferred to be here, in Schloss Rosenau, beautiful hunting lodge about five miles out of town, where Albert was born. It's a place full of his childhood memories, surrounded by quietness, by the hills and the forests. Inconsolably bereaved, she certainly was. And you can see here a page from the visitor's book she wrote in 1862, Victoria Regina, the desolate widow of my beloved Albert.
A direct descendant of Prince Albert keeps the line alive today in the nearby Schloss Kallenberg. Hubertus is the hereditary prince of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. So let's enter the treasure house. One of the rooms here, please. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. You, sir, are the great, great, great grandson. Of yes, Prince that is correct. This is where we show the family relationships between the Sex Cobalt Gotha family and the British. Oh, look, that's a marvelous winter house. Yes. Prince Albert of Sex Cobalt and Gotha. So that's after he's arrived in Britain. Yeah, yeah, it was in the early uh, 1840s. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, he went bald. Oh, and look at this beautiful painting. She didn't dress very well, but she had stupendous jewels. <laughs> That's what the French noticed, didn't they, when she went to Paris? Yes. After she was widowed, she became even more yes. attached to Germany, even more conscious of her German roots, didn't she? And Coburg was a particularly yeah. special well, place. Queen Victoria's roots are in, indeed very German. She was definitely fluent in the German language. And even after the too early death of Prince Albert, she still uh, was, was very much in love with uh, Germany and, and especially Coburg. And uh, she came back to open up a monument for Albert here in 1865 on the marketplace. That was also one of the very few public appearances, apparently, that she did after his death. Oh, yes. Victoria had always loved melodrama since her days as a young queen. And now, in her mourning, she made her loss blindingly clear to see, ever dressed in black. She desired everyone to enter into her grief. Dr. Karina Orbach, an expert in Anglo-German relations, sheds light on Victoria's behavior after Albert's death. She's such a bad psychologist because Albert told her, don't overdo it, please, when, when I'm gone. And she does exactly the opposite. She puts him on this pedestal. She drags her children into the, the room once a year, the room he died in. She uh, keeps preaching him all the time how wonderful he was. And it is absolutely ridiculous because the children, of course, hate it after a while and resent um, everything about this um, idealized father. So it achieves the absolute opposite. She went back again and again and again to Coburg. Yes, I think she would have loved to live just in a little cottage in, in Germany with Albert. That was her ideal. And it was home. It was the Heimat, wasn't it? Yes. She feels relaxed because when, when she talks German, she can be a different person. In her English identity, she has to be the queen. In Germany, she's just the kleine Frau, as Albert calls her. <laughs> Grief-stricken Victoria may have been, but inept she certainly wasn't. She was about to demonstrate her political astuteness in Germany, then not a unified country as we know it today. Germany was merely a notion. The question was, would the various small German duchies and city-states come together in a peaceful federation, or would they allow themselves to be bullied by the northern kingdom of Prussia into becoming a modern militaristic nation? That was the central political drama of Victoria's times. And in that drama, she stood plum center stage. In the summer of 1863, the queen came here to Schloss Ehrenberg. While she was here, she thrust herself between the twin camps of Prussia and Austria before any of her diplomats. It was her first major activity since she was widowed felt so nervous, all being in state, and I alone. I have no longer my beloved Albert to guide, cheer, advise, and pilot me through the great difficulty. Here, in the Hall of Giants, where Victoria's parents were married, we meet Victoria the diplomat, meeting with no less a person than the Emperor of Austria, and together they drank a toast to the unity of Germany. So early in her widowhood, we find Victoria alone, but nonetheless an independent woman, negotiating, not particularly on behalf of England, but on behalf of a peaceful Europe. Victoria had found the inner strength to exert her power and carry out Albert's political work on her own. In this instance, she's a sort of arbiter. She wants to bring together these um, two Germans. There's Emperor of Austria and then William of Prussia. And, and she thinks that um, there should be some 
rapprochement, uh, some understanding between the two. She, um, she still hopes for a peaceful solution of the German question. I mean, during that period, if you'd asked many English newspaper editors, what's the Queen doing? They'd have said she's drawn to sleep, she's drawn into hiding, she's not doing anything. Yeah. As a matter of fact, she was deeply politically engaged in Germany. Yes, I, mean, I think that's when one underestimates her because she's hiding in black and, and, and one doesn't understand that she had her back channels and she was very much into this back channel work. And um, she saw herself, because of Albert, as, um, well, a, a diplomat in many ways. It's interesting at this time that we see the British Queen becoming, partly through her own marriage and the marriages of her children, so intimately involved in European politics. At this time, the British politicians complained that their monarch was too weepy, too reclusive, not doing her work, not interested in the main political questions. But Victoria was looking at the future of Europe itself. That seems to me far less parochial, far less narrow than the things that many of her cabinet ministers wanted. And her role in all this was pivotal. The future of Germany was quite literally being fought out between members of her own family, with her eldest daughter Vicky married to the Crown Prince of Prussia and Bertie married to the Princess of Denmark. Victoria was caught in the middle of the war between these neighboring states. Oh, if Bertie's wife was only a good German and not a Dane. Not as regards the influence of the politics, but as regards the peace and harmony of the family. It is terrible to have the poor boy on the wrong side. The personal was the political for Victoria. Intensely German, she nonetheless felt, as all mothers would, grief that her family stood on opposing sides of the political divide. While Victoria showed her fortitude on the world stage, involving herself in European wars of global significance, she was also finding freedom at home in her personal life. As a young woman, she'd always sought father figures, from the flirtatious Lord Melbourne to her angel, Albert. Now she had another man by her side. I feel I have here and always in the house, a good, devoted soul, whose only object and interest is my service. And God knows how much I want so to be taken care of. These are the words the 45-year-old Victoria wrote about Albert's Highland servant, a Mr. John Brown, who was brought down from Balmoral to attend Victoria at Osborne in 1864. I honestly think that if it hadn't been for the Highlands of Scotland and the friendship of John Brown in those 10 years after Prince Albert died, that Queen Victoria would have gone stark staring mad. She'd always loved it here in Scotland, since her early visits with Albert. And the unaffected character of the Highlanders made such a refreshing change after the stuffiness of Windsor and Buckingham Palace. And so it was that the bearded and kilted John Brown, seven years her junior, became Victoria's next male dependency as closest companion and best friend. Raymond Lamont Brown is the Highland Servants' official biographer. She spent far more time with John Brown than with any other person. Yes. Certainly, with, uh, certainly more than any member of her family. Yes, that's true. He would attend her whenever uh, she needed him. He understood her very well. I think something that her family and her ministers didn't understand, that although she was surrounded by people all the time, she was very lonely. And John Brown said to her quite openly, I think you're just a lonely wee bairn that needs to be brought out of herself. And that's exactly what he did. He sort of pulled her out of her depression. He became a walking encyclopedia of Queen Victoria's likes and dislikes, her neuroses and so on. He devoted 
his life to her. He never went on holiday, and he was always there for her. In some ways, it was an even greater commitment than Albert made himself in his marriage vows. It was, it was a, one of absolute service. Yes, yes. Um, Albert, of course, had, had his own agenda of the things that he did. But for John Brown, uh, from dawn to dusk, his agenda was Queen Victoria. Alongside Brown's devotion to the Queen came an abruptness and complete disregard for court etiquette, something which Brown could see that Victoria, contrary to her steely appearance, rather enjoyed. Whilst these qualities of Brown's enraged the household, they were precisely the things that made him the ideal companion for Victoria. Great man that Albert had been, he'd always been sickly and fussy. He didn't share his wife's love of guzzling and drinking. Whereas Brown loved his whiskey. He was often tipsy. He liked pouring whiskey into the Queen's milk and saying, don't stay thirsty. Victoria wouldn't credit what I'm about to say, but Brown released her from Albert. He released her inner capacity for hedonism and fun, and she reveled in it. Cheerio. Victoria found freedom in her friendship with this most unlikely of characters, out riding and laughing in the grounds at Osborne with Brown. Where she had been suppressed in her childhood by the cruel workings of Sir John Conroy and had struggled with an overbearing and scheming husband, she loved Brown's openness and dedication to her and her alone. It is a real comfort, for Brown is devoted to me. So simple, so intelligent, and so unlike an ordinary servant. No one could talk to Victoria as John Brown did. He held her in check. There was once an occasion when a footman came into the room carrying a tray, and the poor boy dropped it. The Queen erupted with rage, said he should be dismissed to the kitchens. But John Brown intervened immediately. Woman, what are ye doing to that poor laddie? Are ye not dropping anything yourself? The footman was reinstated. The straight-talking Scotsman had put the Queen of England in her place. And she enjoyed it. But it wasn't just Brown's frankness she relished. He also filled a deep emotional need in Victoria. On the fourth anniversary of Albert's death, she completely defied convention by bringing Brown to pay his respects at Albert's mausoleum. Her writings that day show just how significant Brown's response was for Victoria. When he came to my room later, he was so much affected. He said in his simple, expressive way, with such a tender look of pity while the tears rolled down his cheeks. I didn't like to see you at Frogmore this morning. I felt for you. But what could I do for you? I could die for you. I don't think anybody could ever have replaced Prince Albert, but she needed some kind of, of male crutch, and John Brown supplied that. What came next showed the contradictory nature of Victoria's character. The woman who shied away from the public decided to share her thoughts with everyone. We tend to think that Diana, Princess of Wales, invented the concept of feel my pain. But Queen Victoria got there before her with her decision to publish extracts of her private diaries. Leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands. It came out in 1868 and was an instant bestseller. No monarch had ever published a book before. This one was wholly at odds with Victoria the Weeping Widow. The journals chronicle her life of outdoor frivolity. She felt truly elated out in the open Highland landscape, at local dances, and at the annual Highland Games. The games began about three o'clock, she writes. One, throwing the hammer. Two, tossing the chamber. Three, putting the stone. A pretty wild sight. 
but the men looked very cold with nothing but their shirts and kilts on. They ran beautifully. The journals are pretty mild stuff. The remarkable thing about them is that they were published at all. They're nice books, they're bound in green, embossed in gold, and pretty soon they'd sold over 100,000 copies. There is one person, however, that might be named as the hero of the book, and that, of course, is John Brown. Her children hardly got a look in and weren't best pleased. But it seemed that Victoria was unaware. Instead, she wrote to her eldest, Vicky, asking for validation of the book. You have never said one word about my poor little Highland book, my only book. I had hoped that you and Fritz would have liked it. The reason Vicky might have been avoiding the subject was that her mother's shameless adoration of Brown was causing a scandal. A scurrilous pamphlet entitled John Brown's Legs appeared in New York. It was dedicated to those extraordinary legs, poor bruised and scratched darlings. Here's the Queen looking at a damaged knee. Good heavens, what a knee! Uh, sticking out from the kilt of John Brown. What's so hilarious about this is that while the American was penning this pamphlet, the Queen herself was writing a third volume of Leaves from Our Life in the Highlands, in effect, a biography of John Brown. The court and the politicians were absolutely horrified, and somebody had to be delegated to tell her that the book was entirely inappropriate. They chose the poor young Dean of Windsor, and he went in and told the Queen that it really wasn't a very good idea to be writing these memoirs of her life with Brown. It would be misconstrued. She erupted with rage. However, she took the young man's advice, and the matter was never mentioned again. I wonder if it still survives somewhere in Windsor, in those archives, or whether Princess Beatrice, the wrecker, destroyed it. Thanks to Victoria's youngest daughter, Beatrice, no trace remains of the Queen's life with John Brown in her voluminous journals. We're left with silence as her children were intent on deleting Brown and anything else deemed unsuitable from history. It's poignantly sad that so avid a scribbler and recorder of her times as Queen Victoria should have had her words suppressed. And of course, the suppression has the precisely opposite effect upon us that it was intended to do. Instead of making us forget about John Brown and Victoria, it makes us obsessed by the subject. What we do know is that in favoring Brown, Victoria showed herself to be a woman desperate for companionship, irrespective of the social cost. She'd come such a long way from her days as the submissive wife of Albert. With Brown, she was free to do as she pleased. Of course, people suspected him of sleeping with Victoria. There's a bit of a feminist issue here. If she'd been a male monarch going to bed with a parlour maid, no one would have batted an eyelid. It's the idea of a woman crossing the class barrier that really appalled them. Especially as the rumours mounted to that of a secret marriage, even a love child, between the Queen and her Highland servant. A man who was probably one of the very few people in the world who ever knew the full truth about her relationship with Brown was her last doctor, Sir James Reed. Oh, goodness. The whole collection. Michaela, Lady Reed, is married to his grandson. He kept a diary while he yes. worked with her. Yes, and there are 40 little, little tiny diaries here. See, his writing was minuscule. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Yes. If you read a lot, you really require a magnifying glass. Yes. And here are some more diaries. Yes, uh, this is one from March. This is uh, the Queen and Brown, I think. Yes, she has a fall. They were going up and down the stairs, Brown and the Queen. Because Brown, of course, carried her. Reed wasn't well, allowed so much as to touch her. Well, he was allowed to offer his arm. But, I mean, he wasn't but, allowed to examine her. No, med no, medically. no, no, and certainly wouldn't be allowed to carry her up and down Whereas the stairs. Whereas Brown was allowed to enfold yes, her in his arm. Yes, 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 and they were laughing about it all and thought it was great fun. And then, and then the next day, it says, the Queen walked a little in the room Brown lifts his kilt and says, is it there? And she lifts her skirt laughing and says, no, it's here. 
She was moving his big man yes, hand yes. from the side of her bottom. bottom. Head. <laughs> yes, but I think she's pointing, she's lifting probably her pointing long the, skirt. But also, the idea of a woman lifting knee. her skirt in those days. Yes, it? yes. No, it was it's very forward. It's raffish. They were obviously very intimate. Is there a feeling in the, in the Reed family that um, Dr. Reed knew the nature of the relationship? Yes. There is a feeling, and we used to tease Granny, as we called her, his widow, about uh, John Brown and the relationship. And she would always shut, clam she, up. She clammed up. Yeah, she just laughed and dismissed it. What do you think? I don't think they were married. I don't think they even had an immoral affair. I think that they expressed their feelings so much in public. Had they been having an affair, they would have um, been more circumspect about it. There's also the kind of physical detail that we now know yeah. because of Dr. Reed examining her body after she died, isn't there? Yes, she had a prolapsed uterus, which would have made any form of intercourse extremely painful, probably impossible. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was that sort of relationship, and no. I certainly don't think uh, that she would have had a child, because she was... Oh, too, no, that's uh, preposterous, I'm sure. Preposterous, sure which preposterous. has been said. Oh, yes, it has. When anybody knows that I'm writing about Queen Victoria, they've always been asking me the same question. What was the relationship between John Brown and the Queen? Were they lovers? And I'm afraid to say that on that question, I'm a complete agnostic. It's plainly not a relationship like that between her and Albert. She was so open about loving Brown, about wanting Brown to hold her and carry about him public and laugh with her, that I'm sure there was no kind of secret, covert relationship going on. I think the likeliest thing, if you actually wanted to force me to make up my mind, is that they had a tactile, loving relationship which involved lots of hugging, but that they weren't lovers in the true sense of the word. Victoria was never one for convention. Despite giving her name to an era of propriety and prudishness, Victoria was anything but. Where she loved the openness of Brown, she couldn't stand those who were reserved around her. So when it came to her buttoned-up Liberal Prime Minister, W.E. Gladstone, she had no tolerance at all. Mr. Gladstone is a very dangerous man and so very arrogant, tyrannical and obstinate, with no knowledge of the world or human nature. Victoria was not one to mince her words. She used every weapon in her armory, her psychological illnesses, her physical illnesses, to combat what she believed were assaults by the Liberals on the monarchy itself. Her undisguised loathing of this humorless intellectual state showed how very self-assertive Queen Victoria could be. Gladstone was awkward with the Queen, and like his hero, Prime Minister Robert Peel, he didn't have the best way with women. 30 years after her run-in with Peel, Victoria showed herself to be just as belligerent with Gladstone as she had been in her youth. One such occasion occurred in the summer of 1869, when the Lord Mayor of London and Gladstone asked her to open the new Blackfriars Bridge. The Queen was determined to wriggle out of it, and the drama went on and on through the summer and autumn, with Gladstone bearing the brunt of most of the Queen's emotional outbursts. She thought she had clearly expressed that it was impossible for her to open Blackfriars Bridge, but as Mr Gladstone seems still in doubt, she will repeat her sincere regret that it is quite out of the question for her to do anything of the kind in the heat of the summer. The Republicans, the press, but also the keen monarchists were all asking themselves the same question. If the country functioned perfectly well, with the head of state spending most of her year either up in Balmoral or down on the Isle of Wight. Why did we need a monarch at all? And it was to silence that question that the Prime Minister, Mr Gladstone, was determined to parade the little woman on this bridge. And she was equally determined not to be bullied and not to be put under pressure. As July wore on, the Queen dug in her heels 
the Queen is much surprised at being again teased and tormented about this bridge, having three weeks ago nearly been asked by Mr. Gladstone. And she refused to open it, saying, the fatigue of the whole thing being much too great, with the day commencing in the heat. Ever one for mood swings, when it came to the event, Victoria decided she could open the bridge. But what a palaver she had caused in doing so. Frequently caught in the crossfire between Gladstone and his queen was her private secretary, Colonel Henry Punsonby. His great-granddaughter, Laura Punsonby, is the keeper of many a letter penned by Victoria's idiosyncratic hand. <laughs> the queen's handwriting oh, yes. was almost illegible. Incredibly difficult to read. I think I'm getting worse at it. <laughs> <laughs> there are other wonderful these deep black borders, aren't, aren't they? they? These little letters were, were coming out of uh, the Queen's writing desk every 10 minutes. <laughs> That's right. My feeling is that Gladstone found Queen Victoria almost impossible to deal with, whereas Henry Ponsonby was far better at dealing with her. Henry Ponsonby knew what he was doing, I think, in a way. He did all he could to try and make the Queen more reasonable with Gladstone, but she was very, very critical ab about him. Henry Ponsonby knew that it was no good contradicting her. There's a famous story about him which he says, when I say two and two make four, Queen Victoria says, no, they make five. And then he says again, no, I, I, th I think they do make four. And she says, no, you're wrong. Then he said, I leave it, I let it drop and then we go back to it and then it's okay. He knew if he said no, Queen Victoria would immediately dig her heels right in. You know, Henry Ponsonby admired her. She could be absolutely impossible, of course, but he managed to sort of cope with it. And of course, he had a great sense of humor. I think that was the saving thing, wasn't it? He could see how very funny she was. <laughs> That's right. And he got them all laughing at the dinner table. He said he looks round at Queen Victoria and she's absolutely, you know, giggling away. She was known as Furia, mad laugh, Furia. Um, and that, you start laughing and then tears come to your eye and you shake. And all this sort of laughter comes up. She had a lot of furia, didn't she? Yes, she had a lot of furia. She was always having the giggles. Yes. Dadston wasn't particularly humorous. No, no, I think not. It was the weird mix of Victoria's humor and hysteria that the politicians couldn't come to terms with. So much so, they feared for her sanity. And you can see why the establishment were worried. When you look at the correspondence between the Queen and Mr. Gladstone, I mean, look at this. When Gladstone went to stay in Balmoral, he was awkward and couldn't speak to the Queen. She often refused to speak to him. So they would correspond while they were both living in the same house, sometimes as often as six times a day. The letters are particularly comic, I think, really. Uh, Gladstone, his letters, beautifully written, a little pompous, absolutely rational. And she scrawls frenziedly back. It's as if somebody's streaming through paper. Here's one which was written in the afternoon. Just an outburst, really. It is not to Tahiti, but to Honolulu, that the complaints relative to Prince Alfred refer. What that was about, who knows? History doesn't relate. But you do see what Mr. Gladstone was up against. Victoria capriciously showed her Prime Minister time and time again that she was Queen and he couldn't bully her into doing something she didn't want to do. Victoria maintained her hostility to Gladstone to his dying day. The grand old man clung to office long after he became physically incapable. On and off, he was Prime Minister for 26 years. I think the most disgraceful thing about Queen Victoria is the way she behaved to Gladstone at the time of his resignation. He devoted his entire life to the service of his country, and she offered him not one word of thanks. She trusts he will be able to enjoy peace and quiet with his excellent and devoted wife in health and happiness, and that his eyesight may improve. The Queen would gladly have conferred a peerage on Mr. Gladstone, but she knows he would not accept. 
Gladstone's decline and death had little effect on the Queen. Years ago, she had unashamedly fallen for his political opponent, Benjamin Disraeli, whose One Nation Toryism was her kind of politics. Besides, he knew how to make her laugh. At Disraeli's private home in the heart of Buckinghamshire, curator Robert Bandy is the proud keeper of the numerous gifts Victoria lavished on Disraeli. This is the dining room. We have an awful lot of portraits in the house that are gifts from the Queen, and all of them have a crown on the top to tell us exactly who they came from. In case there could be in any doubt. <laughs> in, ca in case there could be in any doubt, exactly. An unconventional visit to Hewenden in 1877 showed Disraeli's political skill and charm. When Disraeli collected the Queen from Wickham Station, he took two carriages with him, one with slightly faster horses, so he could welcome the Queen for the first time on the platform. Obviously, great statesman, showman, lots of bowing and dipping. Very theatrical. Very, very theatrical. People in Wickham loved it. He popped into the first carriage with the quicker horses, got back to Hewenden before the Queen so he could welcome her in exactly the same way, but for a second time, once she got to the front door of the manor. That's delicious. And um, he obviously was mindful she was a slightly short lady and had the bottom two inches of her dining chair <laughs> sawn off so that her feet were flat on the floor when she sat. If she'd sat on a normal chair, of course, her feet would have been dangling in the air. And he didn't think that was particularly becoming of um, the monarch. That's very funny. This is another present from her. So it's the collected speeches of, of Albert. This is very remarkable because at first she was a little bit... She disliked him entirely. Um, when he was just a member of the house. But he grew useful to her because whether she complained that Gladstone referred to her as though she were a public meeting, um, Disraeli gave her the opposite end of the spectrum. He gave her the tittle-tattle and the gossip, and he would write three or four notes a day to her from Parliament. And, of course, she had a very marked sense of humour, and uh, she liked the fact that he made accounts of Parliament and cabinets. Yes. That's so amusing. She laughed over his letters. Now, who have we here on the chimney piece? We've got... Um, John Brown, given by the Queen to Disraeli. Two relative outsiders. Disraeli, the most unlikely Victorian Prime Minister. And Brown, completely out of the normal social sphere for the Queen, that was drawn in closest to her. Very much so. Both Brown and Disraeli gave Victoria the loyalty she always longed for, and she lapped up Dizzy's endless attention and flattery. He is so full of poetry romance and chivalry. When he knelt down to kiss my hand, which he took in both of his, he said, in loving loyalty and faith. Disraeli not only amused and flirted with Victoria, he understood her emotional struggles in life. Professor Jane Ridley has written biographies of both Disraeli and Queen Victoria. Disraeli didn't treat her as a stupid woman. Uh, Disraeli treated her as a sort of exotic and wonderful queen. He also treated her as an equal. He made her feel, by writing her these wonderful um, sort of confidential letters, uh, that he was telling her everything and that he was her minister and together they were ruling the country. Um, so he made her feel, feel good. She wasn't, you know, before she'd had this awful generation of um, those dreadful old men, she called them, who talked down to her and, and didn't sort of... Um, uh, flatter her in this way. But Disraeli is on his knees flattering her right from day one, and she loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> People smiled at Victoria's crush on Disraeli and at his shameless camp manipulation of it. He dubbed her the fairy or the fairy queen. He was genuinely fond of her, but he was prepared to exploit the friendship for political ends. Britain was moving to a position where eventually every male adult would have the vote. And many politicians feared this would mean an inevitable lurch to the left. Disraeli had his finger on the pulse. He knew there were thousands and thousands of lower middle class and working class men who were natural Tories. Victoria became the perfect figurehead for Disraeli's one nation conservatism. His plans involved Victoria as a symbol of British power, not just at home, but stretching far across the world to the empire Showing both political astuteness and glorious creativity, Disraeli announced Victoria was the Empress of India on January the 1st, 1877. 
She was delighted with the new title. My thoughts much taken up with the great event at Delhi today and in India generally, where I am being proclaimed Empress of India. I have for the first time today signed myself as V, R and I. Empress of India. It's a title you might think more appropriate for a railway engine or possibly even a pig. But it made Britain an imperial power. India, in all its exotic expanse, now came under the royal dominion of the fairy. Of course, sophisticated people flinched at the title. But Victoria and Israeli knew that the vast proportion of the British people thought the empire made Britain rich. And for the next 80 years, the empire was the pride of Britain's conservatives and the envy of many beyond its borders. As she'd instinctively used her diplomatic skills in Germany in the years following Albert's death, Victoria leaped at the chance to stand at the helm of Disraeli's political ideals to galvanize Britain's classes under a powerful monarch. There's a glorious romance about being Victoria R. I. rather than simply Victoria Regina. It was a real publicity coup in India. Victoria is extraordinarily popular. They see her as almost a goddess figure, even though she never went there in her life. You know, she has this extraordinary common sense about sort of predicting uh, what's going to happen and about politics. And in, about the Empress of India thing, she was absolutely right. It was a really astute political... It was, wasn't it? Yes. Mm. But the pair's political romance couldn't last forever. Disraeli fought on in politics to his dying day. Victoria showered attention on him right to the end bestowing on him a peerage as Lord Beaconsfield. At his death, she was distraught. I cannot write in the third person at this terrible moment, when I can scarcely see for my fast falling tears. Victoria made the most extraordinary confession to her friend, Lady Waterpark. I know you will feel for me in my great and irreplaceable loss. I have lost so many but none whose loss will be more heavily felt than this of dear Lord Beaconsfield. They are remarkable words when you consider how recently she'd lost her beloved daughter Alice and how intensely she'd mourned the Prince Consort. They show how close Victoria had become, both in politics and in her heart, to Dizzy. Gladstone was the dictatorial prime minister. Disraeli was the true and trusted friend. As if the death of Disraeli wasn't enough for Victoria to cope with, just two years later came the death of the man who may have been the love of her life, John Brown. The queen was devastated. The fatherless widow was alone again. The extent of Victoria's grief on paper is only known in part. These words escaped the ruthless Windsor censorship. I am terribly upset by this loss, which removed one who was so devoted and attached to my service, who did so much for my personal comfort. It is the loss not only of a servant, but of a real friend. Through love and loss, time and time again, Victoria had the remarkable fortitude to carry on in the midst of grief. Far from her widowhood constraining her, she had the strength to reinvent herself and was visibly a new woman aged 68, celebrating her golden jubilee. The crowds from the palace gates up to the abbey were enormous. This never to be forgotten day will always leave the most gratifying and heart-stirring memories behind. The celebrations didn't end in London. They extended far across the reaches of the empire, in India. Am I in India? No, I'm on the Isle of Wight. I'm in the Durbar Room. Victoria added this fantastic wing to Prince Albert's Italianate villa. And what a symbol of her liberation from the Albertian past, her dominion, her imaginative grasp of her empire and of the world itself had expanded so much in her life. It's utterly fantastic.
Victoria had never been to India, but she always had a great affection for its peoples. She'd far rather hear exotic stories of India than talk to her boring Oxford-educated politicians. And so it was decided in her jubilee year that a taste of India would be sent to her in England in the form of two Indian servants from Agra. One of those servants would turn out to be her last great attachment. The man in question was 24-year-old Abdul Karim. Hired as little more than a footman, he was to become the new subject of Victoria's male affections. Abdul Karim, much lighter, tall, and with a fine, serious countenance. Victoria loved the company of Abdul Karim. And now, down the corridors of Osborne House, the wafted the delicious aromas of the spices he'd brought with him from Agra. Cinnamon, cloves, turmeric, cumin, nutmeg, drowning out the pong of overboiled cabbage and mutton. And there he is. Abdul Karim brought with him India in all its colour and splendour, which Victoria welcomed wholeheartedly into her court. Shrabani Basu is the author of the best-selling book on Abdul Karim and Queen Victoria. Unlike Brown, he was a married man. He was a married man, and his wife came to the court as well. Mrs. Karim, as she was called, she was veiled, and he was a good Indian family. He not only got his mother, he got his mother-in-law as well. So there were several of these Borka-clad Muslim ladies around the throne, as it were. Yes. The Queen was so excited because um, she said it's the first Parda ladies in court. If Victoria liked a servant she didn't hold back, Abdul was soon promoted to the position of the Munchi, the Queen's Indian teacher. She wanted to learn about the ordinary people of India, and this was really important to her. She wants to learn the language, and he gives her the everyday phrases, and she shows off, she loves showing off. She has these Indian princes come, and what better than casually use a Hindustani phrase? What were the useful everyday phrases that he taught her? Well, there were the standard things like, uh, you know, tea is too hot, or the egg is not boiled enough. <laughs> uh, but there were also intriguing phrases like, um, I will miss the Munshi very much, and hold me tight. Um, <laughs> where did that come from? That's very charming, isn't it? <laughs> Do you think she did hold him tight? <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> it was a relationship on so many levels. You know, it was mother, son, grandmother, son. It was a uh, closest friend. And at the same time, Queen Victoria liked a strong man next to her. If you see the pattern from John Brown, he was six feet tall, a strong man, um, somebody who cared for her, and the same, Abdul Karim, six feet two, um, standing next to her, looking after her. Definitely the physical, the sensual element was very much part of it. I think that's very revealing. <laughs> None of Victoria's English courtiers liked the Munshi. They thought he was John Brown in a turban, but Victoria seemed not to notice, or perhaps chose to ignore their snobbish and racist feelings towards him. Writing to Vicky, Victoria's words were all praise. He is so good and gentle and understanding. All I want, and is a real comfort to me. Such a good influence with the others. Anything Abdul Karim wanted, he would get. If he wants a nice room, he's given the room. He's given John Brown's old room, and that is noticed. She gives him his own carriage to ride around, he goes around Balmoral, he goes to India on holiday. Can you tell us about what the attitude of the courtiers was towards Abdul? As soon as he started getting all the favours, the resentment started as well. And the Queen accuses them all the time of racism. And she insists that they behave uh, courteously to him, which they don't. I mean, the Munshi invites it because he is a bit arrogant and a bit full of himself. He does strut around, he does rule over, lord over the other Indian servants, but that's the position he's been given. Although unrest at court was mounting, Victoria didn't seem to care. She was simply not going to give up her fondness for her new best friend. And a shameless display of favoritism in June 1890 further incensed her household. The Queen lost a brooch while she was clambering into her carriage, one of the footmen said that he'd seen Abdul Karim's brother-in-law, Hormit Ali, hovering about at the time. Somebody told Mrs. Tuck, the Queen's dresser, that Ali had pinched the brooch 
and sold it to the jewellers in Windsor. Then they got a note from the jeweller to prove it. The Queen was furious, uh, not with the thief, but with Mrs. Touch. She claimed that in India it was perfectly normal to pick things out which didn't belong to you, and it wasn't considered dishonesty at all. And then she rounded on Mrs. Touch. This is what you English call justice. You English, coming from the Queen, who had escaped to Germany when times had got tough, and although she'd spent the previous 50 years on the throne, evidently never really felt at home in Britain itself. As with other members of the court, Dr. Reed wasn't keen on how much time the Queen devoted to the Munshi, especially as he was so often unwell. He had to look after the Munshi, and he sometimes was kept up till midnight, you know, and he was at his wit's end. The Queen went several times to see him in his room and stroked his hand, taking Hindustani lessons, stroking his neck and smoothing his pillows. One doesn't want to be too indelicate, but what was the matter with the poor Munchie? Oh, well, first of all, he'd had scabies, but that was a bit better. But this was a big boil on his neck. How did Reed and the Munchie get along? Oh, um, uh, <laughs> Reed disliked the Munchie hugely. He thought he was a bad egg. He was horrible to his fellow Indians and felt his sense of superiority over all the others. Can you see what she saw in the Munchie? It was clearly Reed couldn't really understand no, it, could he? No, I think what she... He was exotic and he was a symbol of India. Victoria, oblivious to convention, turned a blind eye to the unhappy members of her court. But things came to a head when she insisted the Munchi join her on her annual trip to the sunny Riviera. Victoria had always loved coming to France as a place of escape, traveling around in the years after Albert's death under the name of the Countess of Balmoral. France represented freedom for Victoria. And in 1897, a royal trip to Simier was planned, staying at the swanky new Excelsior Hotel with superb views of the Mediterranean. Drove through the town, along the fine Promenade des Anglais, close to the sea, which looked so lovely in a wonderful deep blue color. But the holiday plans were going awry. An almighty row was about to break out in the household, precipitated by Dr. Reed, who most improperly told the others that the poor Munchie had yet again gone down with a dose of the clap, gonorrhea. They seized on this as the perfect excuse to say, if the Munchie went to Nice, they weren't coming. They were going to be on strike. This precipitated the mother of all tantrums. Mrs. Phipps is chosen to go tell the Queen that if the Munshi goes, we are not going to go. We are going to collectively resign. This is revolt. And the Queen hears this and she gets into a screaming rage. She gets up, she throws everything down from the table. So all these letters, pots, ink pens crashing down. Mrs. Phipps leaves the room in tears and she goes back and tells them what's happened. So at the end of the day, they don't resign, and the Munshi travels, as he always does, uh, with the Queen. So, you know, it's a victory for the Munshi. And it was victory for the Queen, too. But when Victoria paraded with the Munshi on Nice's famous Promenade des Anglais, one of the local newspapers described the Munshi as a mere servant. The Queen was infuriated and insisted that the newspaper print a retraction, stating, that the Munshi was a learned man. Far from being her servant, he was her Indian secretary, her preceptor in the Hindustani town. And, moreover, one of the most important personnages auprès de la reine. The queen was always insistent that the Munshi be respected. Remember, he is my Indian secretary and considered as a gentleman in my suite. In Victoria's eyes, a gentleman wasn't a wealthy landowner. It was someone who had admirable qualities, no matter their class or race. I find it 
One of Victoria's most lovable qualities, her complete lack of snobbishness and her disregard for social constraint. This was the woman who had been supposedly crippled by the death of her husband at the age of 42, but had become so much more than the widow in black. Victoria spent the last 40 years of her life after Albert finding freedom in the most unlikely of relationships. And despite living life shying away from the public, she emerged as an icon of the era, a picture of British power. Just four years before her death, the streets of London were lined with her public, celebrating her Diamond Jubilee in 1897. No one ever, I believe, has met with such an ovation as was given to me. Passing through those six miles of streets, the cheering was quite deafening and every face seemed to be filled with joy. Victoria died in January 1901 after a remarkable 63 years on the throne. And more than a century after her death, her words still command our attention. Victoria had written instructions which she gave to her dresser, Mrs. Tuck, and to the doctor, Dr. Reed. And they told what she wanted to be put in her coffin with her when she died. She was to have the Prince Consort's dressing gown. She was to have various photographs of favorite grandchildren and servants. And she was to have locks of their hair. Perhaps most significant, she was to be holding a framed photograph of John Brown, and on her finger was the ring which he'd given her as his mother's wedding ring. As one walks past that mausoleum at Frogmore, which is nearly always closed, it's a strange thought to think of her lying there, surrounded by all her mementos. The image is emblematic of a queen who liked drama in life and now in death. But sadly, the image isn't one her children could tolerate. All traces of the Queen's unconventional attachments were erased. The Munchie was deported. Her children tried to edit their mother's life, destroying statues of John Brown, censoring her journals, burning her letters. But many of her words survive, and they provide a fascinating insight into this extraordinary human being. Victoria had overcome her pressurized childhood in a controlling political system and had fought through the power struggles of her marriage to a man who had restrained her. In the midst of grief, she emerged as a woman free to move in the world of politics and make deep friendships without constraint. And in all this, she revealed herself a woman who was anything but Victorian. Far from being prim and proper, she loved life in all its richness. She was blind to class and color, and contrary to what we think, had a great sense of humor. When you look at this statue, she seems so stiff, so formal, the Queen Empress. But hear her words, and Victoria lives. <laughs> <laughs> 